we're going to learn to make the cowl that I'm wearing right now. It's called Tesserino Cowl and the design is by Mari Chiba. And this tutorial is brought to us by Louette because this cowl was designed using their Gems Worsted Yarns. This is really nice yarn for a cowl like this. I'm pretty sure you could grab any two colors of the colors they offer and it would make a beautiful cowl since this uses two colors. It's 100% merino wool. It is a dream to work with. It's machine washable and uh, the thing that makes it really good for uh, for knitting like this where you're using two different colors. You want the colors to be clear and the colors to pop and this yarn has really um, tightly twisted plies so there is no kind of muddiness with the cowls all uh, with the colors all the colors really pop and stand out anyway again this is gems merino and i will of course give you a link in the video description field below you can also click the i in the upper right hand corner that will take you to my website where you can click through to louette and take a look at all of the beautiful colors of the gems yarn this is also a free pattern and the link to get your free pattern to follow along in the video will also be in those two places um, the skill level for this is surprisingly <laughs> um, easy. <clears throat> it looks like a fair isle cowl, but it's actually not. It's called mosaic knitting and it's done using slip stitches. You only, you only have one color going per round at a time. It looks like you have two, but you don't. It's deceivingly simple. So um, if you can knit and purl and you're confident with those two things and your uh, tension is nice, you can handle this. I'm going to show you how to do the rest. You can impress all your friends with your knitting skills. Anyway, go ahead and click through to my website and get your free pattern and your yarn and we will get started with the cast on next. If you have your yarn and your free pattern, we are ready to get started on this cowl. Something I didn't mention in the last segment is that this cowl is offered in two different sizes. The size that I was wearing um, in the first segment is the larger of the two sizes. And I was wearing it in a way so you could really see the pattern, but it's actually long enough to wrap twice around my neck so that it's really warm and full and a nice size. And the smaller of the two is about half that size. I think it's about half that size. I'll have to check the cast on numbers. Anyway, the yarn amounts for each size are really clear. Again, just click the little I in the upper right hand corner to go to my website for all of that information on the Louette yarn and the Tesserino pattern. But we're going to get started with the cast on and um, taking a look at, at how to work this pattern. But first I want to give you a close up of the cowl itself. So let's go ahead and take a look. Here is the cowl pattern. I love the way this looks. Um, and it looks hard to do and it's really not and I'm excited to show you how deceivingly simple this pattern is to work. Um, I chose kind of subdued colors. I'm guessing that this is going to look really different and really um, uh, very cool in brighter colors. I'm, I'm excited to see how that all comes out. You, um, the two different colors you're using, one is named the main color, the other is named the contrasting color. Whatever you choose for the main color will end up being your garter stitch border, um, but you can see both colors are equally prominent when it actually comes to the design. So picking your main color will really just set whichever color you want for the, the top and bottom border. But we are going to get started with the cast on here. And I'm going to use much smaller needles and fewer stitches for demonstration purposes. You are going to want to use 24 inch circulars and I'm just using 16 here so it all fits nicely on camera. Now you want to cast on, you're going to have to cast on a lot of stitches. So I'm going to show you a couple of tricks that I always um, employ when I need to cast on a lot of stitches. And the first one will help you make sure that you have enough yarn for the long tail cast on. You don't want to cast on 90 stitches and run out of yarn before you get to the number you need. So this is how to make sure you have enough. Leave yourself about a six inch tail and start wrapping the needle and counting. And usually what I will do is count up to 25, mark that spot, and then that's enough yarn for casting on 25 stitches. So if I double it, that's enough yarn for 50, 75, 100, however much you need for the cast on number, and then mark that spot and put your slip knot there. So you know you have enough yarn and you can start casting on. 
And the other trick I do when I'm casting on a bunch of stitches is to count in my head. And usually if I'm listening to an audiobook or a podcast, I will pause it while I count. And I'll usually count up to 50, double check to make sure it's 50, and then take a stitch marker and pop it on the needle and never count those stitches again. And then go to the next 50. Double check to make sure it's 50, put a stitch, um, a stitch marker on there, never count those again, and keep going. And that keeps you from having to start all the way over at the beginning to count all the stitches each time when you're starting, starting to get close to your target number. Anyway, I have a piece with the cast on already finished here. And so I want to talk to you about joining in the round, just in case that's something you haven't done before. Again, my um, cast on is far fewer stitches than you will need for this cowl, but it's good for demonstration. The first thing you want to do is set it out on a table and take a look because you want to straighten out. You want to straighten everything out. And what I'm going to do is line it up so that all the knots, the knots from the cast on are on the inside. And that requires some untwisting here. So when I look at this now, I can see the knots are all on the inside of the circulars here. And that means it's not twisted and I'm ready to cast or I'm ready to join in the round. I'm scoot everything closer to the tips of the needles. I have my working yarn over here on the right side. I'll pick this up, put a stitch marker on the right needle, and then just start knitting. And there are things you can do to join in the round to make sure you have an even join. And I have a video called um, Three Ways to Join in the Round. And I'll give you a link to that here on screen. Really, I like to just start knitting. In the last segment, I'll show you how to use this tail end to make a really even join. Um, my preferred method is to not use any of those, those um, techniques and just start knitting. But you, can, you can certainly do those techniques to join in the round. So we're joined in the round and we're ready to go and we're working a garter stitch border. And because we're knitting in a tube, because we're knitting in the round, garter stitch is knit a row, purl a row. And if, you, if, if this has never occurred to you before, I know it, it blows a lot of people's minds, but garter stitch when you're knitting a flat piece is knit every row, but it's knit a row, purl a, knit around, purl around when you're working in the round like this. But your pattern will be very clear about what you have to do. And we are actually ready to, the next piece here, I'm going to show you how to work the slip stitch pattern. I have the garter stitch border finished, and I have a little bit of the pattern finished here. I'm going to jump right in, um, in the middle of the pattern because most of the rows are the same. So I'm going to give you an example of, I'm going to give you an example of what most of the rows are like, and then what, uh, what I think 5, 6, 11, 12 are a little bit different, so I want to show you how those are. I'm set up here to work round four. I keep saying row, these are actually rounds. Round four is knit two, slip one, knit five, slip one, knit one. And it's in the main color, which is my, my border color, so it's the lighter color. I've already knit one stitch to keep my stitch marker in place, so I'm going to knit two. The next bit is slip one, so I'm going to put my needle in as if to purl and slide that stitch from the left needle to the right. Knit five. Slip one. Knit one. So with main color, and there's an asterisk, knit two, slip one, knit five, slip one, knit one, repeat from the asterisk to the end. So we just keep repeating this little bit all the way around. So knit two, slip one, knit five, slip one, knit one. I'm actually going to go all the way around so I can show you the next row as well. Knit two, slip one, knit five, 
slip one, knit one. Something else you'll notice in the pattern, we have rounds one and two, three and four, five and six. So every round is, um, is there's kind of, there are pairs of rounds here, which makes it easy to remember what you're doing. Knit two, slip one, knit five, slip one, knit one, knit two, knit five, slip one, knit one. I'm going kind of fast. Um, I do want to get to the end of this round without boring you too much. The main thing here is to uh, keep the pattern in your head and always slip as if to purl. Okay, I finished that round because I'm back to my stitch marker and now I'm going to switch to um, let me get this on here. I'm going to switch to CC, the contrasting color, on row five. It's a really good idea to use a row counter with this, to always, uh, to either do tally marks or use a row counter so you know what row you're on. Slip two, knit seven, slip one. And that's the entire pattern repeat right there. So switching to the other color. And all I've done is I have both colors going here. The other color was just hanging out there in the back. I'm just going to to grab it and start using it now. If we, um, in this pattern, you don't have to do anything special with wrapping the yarns in the back of the work or anything. You can just leave it hanging there because we don't ever have, to, it never has to travel very far from, um, so it's only two rows each color. So where am I? Slip two. So I'm going to put my needle through two stitches as if to purl and slide them over. Knit seven. slip one, and then slip two. Now this is where, this is the technique I want to show you. Because on the last row, we were only slipping one stitch at a time. So we had the yarn over here, we were only slipping one stitch. The float behind the work, the distance that this yarn had to go was only one stitch. But now since we have three stitches slipped, this is a longer distance for that to go. This is actually a fair isle technique that I'm showing you here. Um, because I'm ready to knit seven, and I want to be careful with the tension here. I mean, it's not, it, it's not a difficult technique, but it's something you definitely want to keep in mind. If I just knit the next stitch, you can see the float on the back of the work is jamming those stitches together, and my, my work is going to um, just, just look tight. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these stitches on the right hand needle and stretch them out so that this yarn has a further distance to travel to knit that stitch. And so I can be sure that float is long enough and it's not going to scrunch those stitches together. So I knit seven and I slip one and then two, which is essentially slipping three. And again, I just did the technique. <laughs> it's so automatic for me. I'm ready to knit this next stitch, and I've slipped three. So I'm going to stretch out the stitches on the right-hand needle and then knit my seven to make sure that I leave myself a nice long float in the back. OK. The last thing I want to show you, because that's the, it's the same thing over and over again, the thing you want to be um, the most careful with is keeping track of your rounds, and that's easy to do. But there's one trick here, one other trick here I want to show you, and that is uh, working lifelines. So I'm going to grab a yarn in a different color here and my tapestry needle. This is a proactive lifeline is what I like to call them. I'm taking a, light, a lighter weight of yarn, and this is something I'm going to put in um, into my work, and usually I'll want to do it after row 12, just so I know where I am, so that if I mess up, 
I can take my needles out and unravel to this spot. What I'm going to do is just move my work to the cord and take my tapestry needle and this lighter weight yarn and just pull it through all the stitches as they are on the needle or on the cord. It's easier to, to string the tapestry needle through the stitches on the cord. So I do that all the way around and then just continue working as I was, leaving this in place. Then if you mess up, you can take your needles out and unravel and all your stitches will be safely held here. You'll see even if you take the needle out, those stitches can't unravel because this yarn is holding them in place. Just a little trick you might want to do if you're nervous about starting a pattern that um, you can move forward confidently once you put a lifeline in because you know you, if you mess up it's only going to be that far and you can string a lifeline as often as you like every 12 rounds if you like. Anyway, you're going to keep knitting the pattern like this as many repeats as a pattern tells you or as a, you'd like to work and um, then you're going to work the garter stitch border. Next up we're going to talk about some finishing work and blocking. Once you've finished knitting the entire cowl, we're ready to do some finishing work. Well, sort of finishing work. The, um, the first thing I usually like to do is to block it before I weave in the ends, just to make sure that it has reached its maximum size before I, I weave in the ends. Either way, you can do either one. The yarn, the, the Gems worsted yarn is actually machine washable, but um, right after you finish working on something, I usually want to hand, hand wash it. So let it soak in the sink with some wool soap and then um, I put mine in the dryer on spin cycle to spin out the excess water and set it out flat to dry. And you'll find that even though we were careful with the floats on the back of the work, you do want to stretch it out a little bit. You're going to get a little more length to the cowl than, um, than you had when you were knitting it. Uh, and that's one of the nice things about always sticking with wool when you're doing stranded knitting like this is because the wool is going to be really forgiving. And then set it out flat to dry. Because it's double-sided, you might want to flip it halfway through and let the other side dry. And then the very last thing I want to show you is a little trick for tidying up the, the jog that was created when we joined in the round. You can do this little trick on both the cast-on row and the bind-off row, round. I keep saying row. We're actually knitting in the round. So <laughs> let's go ahead and take a look. We're going back to this sample where I left my lifeline in from the last segment. This is the cast on row and I, the jog here isn't bad but I can make that look better when I go to weave in this end. And this is something that I do, this is how I weave in the end every time I weave in the end when I'm knitting in the round. It's just a, a technique that I always use to make it look really good and smooth on the cast on and bind off edges. So I thread, I put the, um, the tail on a tapestry needle. I'm going to go through, I usually end up trying it a couple times. I'm going to go through, yeah, the stitch here, right here at the slip knot. And then go back down to the same place I came out of, essentially, sort of right there. That looks really good. The slip knot's kind of sticking out. Let me try that again. Even though I've done this 8,000 times in my life, I usually end up trying it a couple different times to see which one I like better. I'm going to go behind the slip knot this time. You see there's two legs of the V right there? See if I can get the slip knot kind of squished down. Go back in the same place I came out of. No, this might not work. This might be too far. Nope, that doesn't, well, I got rid of the slip knot, but I don't like the way the work looks right there. I'm going to go back to the way it was. Honestly, people, this is exactly the way I always do it. <laughs> I always do it two or three times to make sure I like how it looks. I liked it better when I went right here at the slip knot. And then once that's finished, you have, usually my slip knot isn't sticking out quite that much, but once that's finished, you have a nice clean edge and you can just weave in this end in the back of the work for an inch or so and then cut the yarn short. This will also smooth out a bit with blocking. I can make sure to straighten out the rows. Oh, 
that also reminds me, I know there's going to be a question that um, didn't really come up in, in the sample I was knitting, but people are going to ask, should we do the color change jog correction? And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Just follow the pattern. But people are going to ask, should we do the color change jog correction when we're changing um, colors between the rounds? And the answer is no. I actually tried it both ways to see how it would look. And the reason it doesn't really work in this pattern is because of the slip stitches. So there's no need to. It's because we have slip stitches right up front in the row sometimes that that's, um, that technique is not going to work. If you're curious about what that technique is, I'll give you a link here on screen to take you to that. Um, the technique is very cool and works with most patterns. Okay, I'm glad I remembered that. Just looking at the work here reminded me. Anyway, many thanks to Mari Chiba for letting us use her pattern in this, in this tutorial, and many thanks to Luet and their Gems Worsted Yarn for being the perfect yarn for Mari's pattern and sponsoring this video. I can't wait to see what color combinations y'all put together for this. Good luck.